life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hello. Hello. And welcome. <laughs> wakey, wakey, everybody. Welcome to our September book podcast. We, as of this podcast, are doing things a little bit different. In the past, we have basically talked about every single book that we've read in the month, and we were thinking that's a little bit overkill. So starting in this episode, we will only be talking about our top five favorite books each that we have read this month since both Marshall and I have read different books. Yeah. But also on top of that, you will be seeing some different book podcasts. We have one planned starting in 2022. We will be doing some other topics, mm -hmm. maybe reading some backlists from other authors, mm. etc. So if you're excited for that, you know, make sure that you are following us so you don't miss anything because here on Elated Geek, the holidays are going to be busy. Yes. One of the things that we really want to do with Elated Geek is present you with the things that just bring us joy. And we spent so much time talking about things that were like, yeah, that's kind of nice. But let's just focus on the joy now. That's right. The yes. things that make you happy. So we will tell you, though, exactly how many books we read each month. Mm -hmm. Yes? Why yes. don't we start with you, man? Oh, I read a total of 29 books. Wow. I was one book shy of one a day. And how did you do this, considering, like, last month you read one book? The one thing that really messes with these numbers is the fact that I do the Spinner Rack Kids podcast with Corey, mm -hmm. and he presents me with a huge dump of comic books to read on a particular subject. And so 19 of my <laughs> books were comics. Wow. Also jumping up those numbers is the number of small books that I managed to find. I had a couple of goosebumps that I did not like. I also had this book from the Avatar series that was just like 64 pages. So my number of pages didn't go that high. Gotcha. But I did jump up a level. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I read 16 books this month. It's about my average. My average is about 17. Um, I really thought I was going to finish that 17th book before the end of the month, and it just, it did not happen. Mm. So I only got 16, but it's it's respectable, for yeah. sure. Yes. It's how many pages did you say? I read 4,743 pages. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so I read 5,871. Mm. So yes, my, my books averaged about 350, 400 pages a piece so that's why i'm up there <laughs> and one thing that i do notice that and we'll get to it when we get to it one of those books is done entirely as an audiobook and they never had an actual page count so you and i had to estimate the mm -hmm. page count on it right. but it, it was you know an okay number okay well let's start talking about our book for my honorable mention you're <laughs> i'm gonna disclaim this right up front i got it from from netgalley but the whole reason why I decided I was going to read this book is because a guy at work, his wife, was one of the editors on this book. Okay. So I would never have picked this book up at all. And really, the reason why it's an honorable mention is because I wanted to help her promote it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit. It is an anthology, which is not a book that I don't usually like anthologies unless there's a really cool line of story woven in it. This book is called Battle of the Bands. Her name is Lauren Gribaldi and I think the other guy who edits it is Eric Smith. So there's a lot of other authors in here as well but those two should help you find it if you are interested. And it is a collection of stories about, it's a young adult book and it's about musicians and how they're all going to this Battle of the Bands and when they get to the end it all kind of comes together. Like all the stories are woven. You'll be able to understand kind of how they're all connected. So it's an anthology, but it's also one big story. In a way, but in a way not. Yeah. It, I've seen some anime that were like that, where mm -hmm. each each different director had a completely different style, but they were all kind of telling the same right. story at the end. I think the stories themselves are really accessible. Um, 
a couple of the ones I all I could think of was School of Rock. You know how they want to mm-hmm. they want to be at the the big band festival, um, and that's what made me think of that. Like every time I read one of the stories, but I think it's a good time, especially if you like anthologies. You should definitely check this out. But I I thought it was a it was a good time. It was a good reading. Cool. I'm not typically for anthologies unless they're all from the same author, mm-hmm. but. Like, was there anything in this that actually connected directly with you, or...? Not really. I just thought it was fun. I liked that it was kind of a YA type Mm -hmm. of short story collection, so it was a lot easier to read, in my opinion, than something that was, like, a heavier anthology. So we're going to start with our number five. I started off, and this is one of my first few from the month, it was Falling by T.J. Newman. That book we got from Libro, Mm -hmm. because we are a Libro affiliate. Thank you, Libro. We are not sponsored. We just get free books every month to listen to, and Falling was one of them. Yes. I have not listened to this book yet, so this is, you know... Marshall has. Yes. So this is a thriller, and it is about this pilot who gets into his commercial airliner, is about ready to take off, and he gets a message that a terrorist has his family, and he is going to crash the plane into some unknown location, or his family is going to die. Wow. Yeah. How does he handle it? How does the crew handle it if they find out? What does... There's a lot of moving parts on this, but it is very rooted in reality. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love the most about it is that the bad guys of this story, they're humanized. They're given a reason why they're doing it, and it's not a bad reason. Mm -hmm. But the book makes absolutely no attempt to make them out as victims. So how is the pacing in this story? Pretty fast. Once you get past the first little chunk of it where, okay, well, they're all just kind of getting into place. After that, it's just a roller coaster ride. It goes so fast. Mm. And you're really feeling for a lot of these characters. And you're wondering if how many of them are going to make it out alive, okay. if any of them. Wow. Is there, like, a specific thing about this book that really connected to you personally? Or, like, what was it about this book that you were like, yes, I love this book? We lived through 9-11. We actually watched on the news as it happened. And... This kind of hits a lot of those story notes. So, yeah, it has a personal meaning to people of our age. But, again, the the villains' reasons for why they're doing what they're doing is still very relevant today. Right. And a book like this brings awareness to a lot of these people's plights. Right, gotcha. Interesting. So what's your number five? My number five is the young adult fantasy sequel to the first book, The Last Graduate by Naomi Novik. This is the second book in the Scholomance series. The first book being A Deadly Education. This book comes out September 28th. uh, So it is, it just came out like last week, I think. This book is a continuation of Elle. And because there are monsters all over the school, the monsters try to kill and eat all of the students. You're not really expected to make it out a lot of the time. Graduation is, in order to get out, you have to go through this like gymnasium area full of monsters. So the year before, and this is a little bit of a spoiler if you haven't read the first one, the year before she and her friends and her friend who is a boy, Orion, <laughs> there's a, it's kind of like a will they, won't they thing. Mm-hmm. They try to do things to eliminate the monsters that are down there during graduation. And there's like this whole cleansing mechanism that's supposed to happen in between years. So you're literally stuck in this school for, and you've read this book, right? Yeah, I read the first one. Right, so you're stuck in this school for four years. You know, you start at the top of the school if you're a freshman, and then your floor moves down to the bottom of the school. And then when you're a senior, you're almost in the place you need to be for graduation so then you can get out. Yeah, because the whole school is just one gigantic machine churning fresh meat down to the monsters. Correct. But at the same time, there are no adults in the school Mm -hmm. and everything is self-taught, but the school itself is magical. Like, Mm -hmm. if you don't do certain things or, like, pay attention to your studies in a certain way, the school may not like that so much (laughs) but also at the same time you're kind of driven to study very heavily because if you don't 
you don't survive. Correct. Exactly. And I think in the past, which you really see in the first book, the groups of people only really kind of take care of themselves. Like if you sit Mm -hmm. the same table with people all the time, that's kind of like your group and that's who you look out for. But in the second book, Elle has kind of figured out that in order for everyone to survive, not only does she need to educate everyone in the school, including the new freshmen that are coming in, but also she needs to figure out a way for graduation to not be such a massacre for her class. And it is a very cool how that happens. Elle and Orion both have powers, abilities yes. that allow them to be proficient at killing monsters. So they use those abilities in the second book to figure out how it might happen. Now, I want to say that the cliffhanger at the end of this book is horrible. (laughs) It's a horrible cliffhanger because you will read it and go, no, no, what's, no, when is the next book coming out? Because I need now, where is it? (laughs) (laughs) Great. That is why I like this book so much. I didn't like it as much as the first one, but I did. I did like it. Are there any characters that you really connect with? At this point, I cannot I cannot really remember. I read this pretty early on in the month. I love a lot of the characters in this book. They're, they're just so, like, fun. There's one character, and I can't remember her name, but she basically raises mice. Yes. Yes? What is her? I can't remember her name. I can't remember her name, but I know exactly she who you're talking mice. about. Cause she raises Because she then, like, it was very near the end of the last book. She was like... Yeah, you want one? I got. Yeah, we can all have for- yeah. mouse familiars. So they all have little mice familiars, and then somebody, and this is not a spoiler, but somebody also crafted like these bandoliers mm-hmm. with with cups so the mice can ride around with them to like all their oh, classes and stuff. So, so they become like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is something that I really like about this because the first book was very competitive. And from what you're describing, it completely changed its direction to being, okay, we're all going to make it out this time. Yeah, pretty I much. I like that idea. Pretty much. Uh-huh. That's a good evolution. Right. So my number four was No One Goes Alone by Eric Larson. And this was another Libro book that we got. Well, you can also get it on Amazon, but yeah, Libro was the one that gave it to us. Mm-hmm. And this book is done only as an audiobook because Eric Larson was like, the best ghost stories are always told with your voice over a campfire. Mm-hmm. And this is a ghost story, kind of. It is very spooky. It is very, what is going on? Right. And you're going to spend a lot of time going, What? This is set in a particular period. It's been inspired by a number of very real people. So like Tesla, Houdini. They're not actually in the book, but people that are like them are in the book as the main characters. And they're all kind of interacting with each other and trying to figure out the mystery of this island that people keep on going missing on. And why is this happening? And then suddenly a body washes up on the shore and they don't know what's going on. But they're also stuck there. Like, their boat vanishes. Okay. So, yeah, it, it's it's very spooky. The ending was not what I was really expecting, but it was kind of interesting. But you liked it better than Falling. I did like it, it better than Falling, just because it was it was a little bit more my speed, because it's, it's a spooky, paranormal right. story. But it was interesting. Uh, it does keep you wondering the entire time what's going on. Do you think the ending was satisfactory for the story? Yes. It is probably not what you think it's going to be, but it is definitely satisfying for the type of book that it is. My fourth book is The Last House on Needless Street. This is by Catriona Ward. This is definitely a horror book. So for those of you who are a little squeamish, you might have issues with this book, but I'll go into that in a minute. I'm going to read a little bit from Goodreads because I think it kind of sums it up and it's very short. This is the story of a serial killer, a stolen child, revenge, death, and an ordinary house at the end of an ordinary street. And that is very true. In this book, we follow three points of view. The first point of view is a man named Ted. Ted lives in this ordinary house. We follow his cat, Olivia. And we follow a woman named Dee, whose sister has gone missing years, like 15 years prior. And she is trying to follow the clues to figure out what happened 
to her sister. Mm. And the thing about Ted is that Ted is kind of an off human being. He's not all there. One would say he might have trauma in his life. It is very hard to talk about this book without giving it away. Mm. The twists, wow. It was twist on twist on twist on twist on twist. And I have to say that my one my one criticism about this book has to do with the twists. In that probably like I was three quarters of the way through when the kind of big twist hits you. And I was like, where are we going from here? <laughs> mm. You know, you've already like shown your cards. And to be honest, I guess that twist but that's just how my brain works. I yeah. sit there and analyze it, especially when it's in funky situations. But that doesn't matter because after you get to that twist, you're very much slapped in the face with a couple more that you didn't see coming. The end result of all of this is an eye-opening subject that I don't think is talked about enough. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you what that is. Because, because if so, I do, it's, so it's the, the story. twist. Yeah. But I will tell you that when it hits you, you're going to be like, oh, yeah. But the reason why is it's just, it's all horrifying. And it all comes together. It really does. I loved Olivia the Cat is so funny. I was hearing some things in some of those comments that it's a religious cat. Sometimes it is a religious cat. It's also might be a lesbian cat. Okay. Um, because she <laughs> looks outside the house and sees like a white fluffy cat who pre- there's a white fluffy cat outside our house all the yes. time that our cats love watching. Same thing. Yes. <laughs> the main character Ted actually does, and I can tell you this, that he goes to a therapist and talks about how his cat is a lesbian and he doesn't know how he feels about that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, so yeah, there are some funny points in this book, but I'm just preparing you. It is not the easiest of subjects to read about. Okay. I mean, I'm really interested just because like, A, you know, I'm really into books that do talk about real societal issues Mm -hmm. that address them within their fictional universe as part of the plot. Right. But also this Olivia cat just sounds hilarious. Yes. She's great. She's really great. Maybe we should take a moment to tell you what I'm drinking. Because I know in the past people have been like, you know, what's your tea? I drink a lot of tea. I drink at least one one thing of tea a day to kind of help me clear out my system. Today, I got a brand new tea. Matcha mate grapefruit. So mm-hmm. it's yerba mate and matcha green tea and a grapefruit. It is very good. It's very refreshing. And the caffeine level is three out of five. Woot. So yay for that. My number three was Paper Girls by Brian K. Vaughn. This is actually a series of six graphic novels that I just devoured. They were, they're the story of these girls in, I think they're the 80s and the 90s, that they run a paper route. And, you know, you got your usual weirdness with, you know, stupid teenagers. But then at one point, they end up finding this bizarre time machine, and it explodes. And now they're jumping all through the time-space continuum. They have no idea what's going on. There's time loops. There's lots of great character drama. Interesting. And it's all about how this event kind of brings them together. So you read this in preparation for your time travel comic podcast mm-hmm. that's coming up? Yes. And so it, I was not necessarily expecting it to be as good as it was, but like the, the flow of the time stuff was really good and the characters are excellent. It's very good female empowerment stories. It deals very heavily with the idea of people trying to control the narrative stuff like that Mm. um who is the rebel and who is the one that's preserving things like that gotcha um and i don't think it's for everyone but it was definitely for me like this was this was something i just love i could i couldn't put it down i almost read it in one sitting all six of them i mean it doesn't really seem like my kind of thing no probably isn't no but i think 
Corey and I are going to have a long discussion about it. <laughs> yeah. Again, graphic novels are not my thing either. Yeah. Right. Don't worry. That's the last set of graphic novels on this list. Awesome. My number three book is Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney. What? Paper Girls? Rock, Paper, Scissors? There's a theme going here. <laughs> Maybe. I ended up getting this book from Book of the Month. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I have not been connected to Alice Feeney's previous work. There are some that I thought were great, and there are some that I was kind of, like, iffy about, okay? So I went into this thinking, I might not like it, okay? It is a thriller book. It is about a couple, the Wrights, who think they have won a raffle at, I think, the wife's work which is like a dog rescue organization of some sort. And the raffle is a weekend away at a snowy mountain house Mm -hmm. that used to be a church chapel. And this is kind of funny, too, when I was reading it, because, you know, I just did finish reading The Spires by Kate Moretti last month. And The Spires also takes place in a church that is being renovated into a house. But that's neither here nor there. The other part of this book is uh, there is a, uh, a woman caretaker that also has a point of view in this book, as well as letters written by Mrs. Wright to her husband every year on their anniversary. But she has never sent them to mm-hmm. him. It's kind of like her diary of things that have happened. So they go to this retreat and things start getting a little creepy and a little bit spooky and then things start connecting to things in their life maybe. I can't say any more, but I was very presently surprised. Mm-hmm. The ending did not see coming. That is why I gave this one four and a half stars. And even that surprised me (laughs) that I gave it this book, uh, that score. Uh, You said you aren't really interested in this book. I'm not as interested in it as some of the other ones that are on your list. Right. But, you know, it does seem like an an interesting thriller for some people. I, I mean, I read on there that Adam Wright, he has... He can't remember people's faces. Oh, and that that is a really good thing. He can't even remember his wife's face. Yeah, he can't remember his wife's face. He has that medical problem where it's all, like, blank. So Mm -hmm. he recognizes people by, like, smell or, like, how he can feel their body energy or whatever. So that's how he can, like, figure people out. It is an issue (laughs) in this book. It does come up quite a lot. And I thought that was a really interesting take on this, too, that... You know, there are some things that happen in this book where it really would have been really helpful if you had been able to see what that person looked like or their face or whatever. He suffers from trauma. His mother died right in front of him in a car accident. So he suffers a lot, too, from that whole deal that, that, you know, his mother is dead. I think that kind of plays in a lot to his marriage and other things that have happened in his life, especially because he doesn't know a lot about who was responsible and can't identify anyone either, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And even even me saying that, if you go back and read the book and then go back and hear what I just said, may have been a red herring. I'm just saying. Okay. Just saying. There's a lot in this book that's like, what? <laughs> what just happened? But it was fantastic. I really loved it. And I honestly don't think that the summary on Goodreads actually describes this book correctly. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going by. I was kind of looking at the Goodreads summary, and I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound bad, but I'm not entirely certain how interested I am. Yes. You think I might be more interested than it seems. I think, too, that, I mean, I kept it. I kept this book. You know, it's not one of those that's going in my swap pile or anything, but I think also it is a really good one to read in the winter because it's, Mm. you could get snowed in, that kind of a thing. So So I, I could probably read it in, like, December or something. Mm -hmm, For sure. Okay. My number two is For Your Own Good by Samantha Downing. And you read this last month, wasn't it? Uh, Correct. I read it last month and then I listened to some of it in the car with you while you were reading it this month. This was a really good thriller. It was fun. Yes. It it was so much fun. Now, if you're going to this thriller being like, oh, what's the secrets? What's really going on? That's not what this is. No. This book 
we'll start off. The book focuses on this one particular teacher. He's an English teacher. One of his favorite books is, I can't even remember the name of the book that is his favorite, but the, the whole focus of the story is on the struggles between two classes and how the people who have all the money treat people who have no money like you garbage. Mean Romeo and Juliet? N you're funny, but no, that's not the book. <laughs> I know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's The Outsiders. The Outsiders, yes. Yeah. And he basically tries to invert it. He treats people like garbage because he thinks they think they're better than him. Mm -hmm. And so he oftentimes will keep students back mm -hmm. because he thinks that they are being snotty or his parents are being or, or those yes as we see right at the mm -hmm. very beginning the kid himself has no psychological problems he's not mean to anybody he's really just nice but his parents are pushy mm -hmm. so the teacher hurts him there and then we find out he's also doing stuff to other teachers he, he's giving them little, like micro doses of poison in order to, you know, keep them in their place. None of this is a secret. Yeah, this is none all just it. like the first couple chapters. Yeah, none of this. Yeah. So when we start getting into deaths start happening, mm -hmm. people start dying everywhere, people get blamed for it, you're not really surprised as to who's behind it. But how do we catch them? Yes. That's the story. Yeah. How does everybody put it together when... One of his biggest gripes, the police seem to be completely ineffectual. Yeah. I think that one of the most successful things about this book is that you start this book off, if you really rely on the teacher narrator, as there is a couple points of view in this book, mm -hmm. but if you rely on the teacher narrator, then you, at the beginning of the book, hold some of the characters in a certain light where you think, oh, the, you know, I don't like this character or this character is a bad character or whatever. But then when you start getting to the end of the book, your perceptions of them have completely turned on its head. And at least for me, I don't know if the same was for it you. It wasn't true of me, actually. Right from the get-go, I was like, this kid, there's nothing wrong with him. Mm -hmm. This other person, they're not so bad. This person here that, that died, I'm like, uh, it's not good that you died, but... I, I see why he chose you. So the, the, it's like a, almost a morally gray serial killer. <laughs> it, well, yes, but the the thing that I noticed was really interesting about this, and it's still no secret. Once you get once you get part way through, he's got all the same problems of all the people that he's he's yes he is what he's punishing. Yes, exactly. So, what was your favorite thing about this book? It was just how the characters kind of got to it. Like, it was very thrilling. Once you got past the first few, the the boring portions mm -hmm. at the very beginning, once you got past that, it was, again, a roller coaster ride, trying to figure out how they're going to do it. Right. And how all these pieces come together. And you really don't pick up the ending until, like, a little bit before it happens. At least I didn't. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, huh... This character is going to be more important than they're trying to make him out to be. And then they ended up being very important mm -hmm. to the ending. And I was right. like, oh, cool. I called that. Great. <laughs> <laughs> My second favorite book this month is The Hawthorne Legacy by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is the sequel to The Inheritance Games. And in it, we follow Avery, who is still trying to figure out why she has the inheritance mm -hmm. of... The Hawthorne Legacy. The Hawthorne Legacy. <laughs> <laughs> inheritance. She continues to follow clues through all of this. She does find out, and this is not a spoiler because it is on Goodreads, it is she knows she's not a Hawthorne because of a DNA yeah. test. So you do find out, though, who the Hawthorne legacy really is. And on top of that, you find out other things that happened for Avery's past in her real blood family. You find out the continued game that is happening. You, you keep playing it, really. But this time, there's a more of a community of people that are trying to help her because you have all of the Hawthorne grand boys. You've got two girls who are in the first book, and I don't remember their names, but they neither one of them have a very good relationship with Avery in the first book, but they're kind of like, we're committed to figuring out what this is all about because of 
one of them is the sister of the dead girl mm-hmm. that yes it's, it's all connected guys like so if i said it's this girl who was dating this guy who was like you know okay yeah. whatever <laughs> and then there's this love triangle still between grayson and jameson so you don't really know who she's gonna pick and at this point i don't even know who i want her to pick but it is a, it is a good like sequel book i think it was very interesting and yes we finally got an answer but this is not the last book there is one more book after this so yay I did remember in the end of the first book, they kind of gave you a really good hint as to why she is part of this. Mm -hmm. That it is related to something in the film. Like, it it was a... I'm I'm having a difficult time remembering it right now, but I'll probably remember it as soon as I pick up the book. Uh (laughs) But it was like, she is not blood-related, but something happened. Yes. And it's a really big event. I will tell you, she is connected to the family. She just doesn't know how. And it's not by blood. So that's one thing that she is finding out in this book, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Now, there's also a big element in the first book where the media and people trying to do assassinations Mm -hmm. were... Is that a part of this book, too? Uh, It kind of continues on, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, the media isn't, like, trying to do it. But, yes, there are members of the Hawthorne family who don't necessarily think she should be having the money and because they're running out of money themselves and kind of grubby greedy they're trying to manipulate the situation yes Mm. so now we're on to our number ones number one book the ninth house by lee bardugo many of you have probably watched shadow and bone on netflix we have both read shadow and bone i managed to read the six of crows this has nothing to do with any of that Mm mm-hmm same author, but this one is set in more of a realistic, somewhat setting. Right. It takes place at Yale. So if you watch Skull and Bones, there was this this plot of all these secret societies that are there at Yale. And how those people later go on to be world leaders and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Well, this takes that into a new turn by saying that all of these secret societies actually have access to magic and many times this magic is manipulating the dead Mm -hmm. or at least calling the dead over and part of this is that they're using the students and all their you know life and their magical energy to empower the elder generations and keep them in power Mm -hmm. so obviously there's going to have to be somebody who's in charge of keeping them all in line right that is the ninth house And we focus on uh, the newest member of this house, which only has, like, two people in it. Right. Well, three, if you include their research assistant. Right. And... There's usually... There's usually only one, though. And then they train. And since the training takes, like, two years or something, technically there is two. But but I think at some point... One of them is called the Dante. And Uh they are the the freshmen, basically. And then you have the Virgil, who is the one who's been doing this job the whole time. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, here's how you do the job. You're going to shadow me. Okay, cool. I graduated. I'm out. Mm-hmm. And then they have their research assistant, who they refer to as Oculus. One of my favorite characters in the book. She's so... She is great. She's so cute. You don't think you're going to like her very much? You think she's going to be kind of this, you know, standoffish little like grumpy book grumpy in the corner you know grumpy but no she actually is great yeah she just kind of as soon as she's actually useful she just goes bam i'm there mm-hmm. and she's got everything you need fun fact this book is going to be a either a movie or a tv show i can't remember which on amazon yeah you said it was an amazon show yes yeah and so we're focusing on the new dante Her name is Galaxy. She goes by Alex. Mm -hmm. And unlike everyone else, she can see ghosts naturally. Whereas I think the rest of them, like uh, her, the guy who is training her, whose name is Darlington, which I think is a fantastic name. By the way, his name is actually Daniel Arlington III, but Mm -hmm. he just, everybody just calls him Darlington. They have to take like a special potion and it Mm -hmm. really messes up their system every time they take it. To the point that uh, once you graduate, you really shouldn't be taking it anymore because it could cause permanent liver damage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's got some other things. But things get a little weirder as Darlington goes missing and the conditions are somewhat mysterious. Yes, and Alex has not finished her training. 
nowhere near. She has she doesn't know what to do with a lot of things. And then she gets called up for a murder that has happened on campus to see, well, is this related to anybody in the secret societies? And she's like, maybe. I don't think so. Okay, cool. It wasn't it wasn't them. Okay, I got it. But maybe it was. Yeah. Maybe it was. Yeah, it's it totally well. Everything starts flying every which direction. People are trying to kill her. This book reminds me of the Dresden Files a lot. Mm-hmm. And if you like the Dresden Files, you'll like this book. Yeah. And it is just a little bit on the darker, spookier side of fantasy mystery story. Yeah, exactly. I liked the twist at the end. I called the villain within the first few chapters, but there was a twist at the end that explains a lot because they have yet to actually find Darlington by the end of the right, book. Right, yeah. But I found it really fun. I enjoyed yeah. it. I, you know, we have talked about this before, but I did DNF this book and then I went back and tried it in a different format than audio and I did enjoy it a lot more. I, I liked this book a lot once I read it physically instead of audio. I can t- probably say, yeah, you probably do want to read it in physical be- just because there's a lot of stuff in there that's done, it seems like, as found documents. Mm-hmm. All right, let's talk about my favorite book for the month. This is The Book of Magic by Alice Hoffman. Now, if you look this book up, it will say number two of Practical Magic. It is actually the fourth book to come out in the Practical Magic universe. So, and the reason why I say that is because the they call book zero is Magic Lessons, mm-hmm. which follows Maria Owens uh, way back when during the Salem Witch Trials. Marshall, you've read that book. Yes, I um, really enjoyed it. it then the book common. after that is called The Rules of Magic. I have not read that book. I think it's book point five is that one. Um, that one actually, funny enough, is going to be a movie also. I think they're developing it right now. So it's on my list to read this fall. Then is Practical Magic, which is number one. And this book is number two. It follows Jet Franny. That's the other one. Mm -hmm. So Jet and Franny are super old at this point. They're probably in their 60s. And um, then we have Jillian and Sally, and they are, you know, their nieces. Then we have Sally's children, which is Kylie and Antonia. And of course, as we know, Maria Owen's curse means that if you love, something will happen to the person that you love. You will, you can never stay in love. And at this point, Sally has been, uh, if you are familiar with Practical Magic, in that book and movie, she uh, marries a, a guy and he ends up getting killed. And then she meets the detective who comes into the story later and she ends up marrying him. But then he, at the beginning of this book, ends up getting killed also in a different way. Oh, that sucks. Very much so. So at this point, you really feel for Sally because you're like, ugh. Sally's daughter, Kylie, she's the youngest daughter, has been in love, kind of, with a boy from, like, elementary school. Like, they've been in love together. But they've been kind of, like, just not really, Doing you know, it, saying it, that they yeah, have been. Okay. Um, and then they go to college together and whatever. And then he go, gets into a car accident and he's in a coma. And at that point, Kylie decides that she's going to try to figure out how to break this curse. What also is interesting about this book is that every woman in the Owens family tries to have some kind of romantic relationship in their own way to hide it from the fates or whatever in different ways. So like, for example, none of this is spoilers, but for example, Jillian basically lives in a house with the guy she's with, but they live in like a duplex. So they live in two separate parts of the house and neither the twins shall meet, Mm -hmm. but yes, they are together. Um, Antonia, she's pregnant by her best friend, but her best friend is gay. So she's more, it's hers is more of a love of the child that she's going to carry because she's afraid to ever fall in love with anyone. Yeah. Um, she's also gay, I believe. And, you know, so it kind of like, it all goes from there. So they all now go and follow Kylie to England 
to to the original place where Maria Owens started this mm-hmm. whole journey. Yeah. And try to break the curse. And it is beautiful. Also, and I thought this was a spoiler. It's not a spoiler, really. There is a brother named Vincent of Jet and Franny who is introduced in the Rules of Magic book. And he lives in France and has faked his own death so that he can be with the person he loves. So he joins up with them. Okay. And he helps them with this whole thing that's happening and uh, the book it just it doesn't lag ever it's just beautifully written it is just an amazing wrap up for this series even though i haven't read all of it it's it's just it's a gorgeous book it's gorgeous one of the things that i remember and it kind of was somewhat calming to me in a weird way yes of when i was doing magic lessons was in between each chapter they had various recipes and spells from their book Mm -hmm. do they do that here too they do not no okay i also know that this book does deal heavily with a book that was introduced in magic lessons called the book of ravens right so this kind of really brings all the series around Mm -hmm. together Mm -hmm. Uh, i like that thought now Magic Lessons was the third one that came out, even though it's number zero, correct? Correct. So yes. we kind of went further and further back, and now we're going back to see how it ends. Right. That's an interesting way of writing it. Yeah. So I think, I don't know if she planned this when she did Practical Magic, but it, yeah, it goes, it kind of goes backwards. So she kept going further back. So Practical Magic, then Magic Lessons, which is about Jet and Franny and Vincent when they were younger, and then Maria Owens in the first book, and then back to everybody else in the last book. And mm-hmm. Yes, there are some people from the first book that kind of show up in their own way, even if it's just like in memories or Mm. in other things that happen in this book. It kind of all bring. It does really bring everybody back together. Excellent. Um, I I wouldn't say that it was. It's one of those reads that you're like uh, a thriller or it's going to go super fast. It's very much fantasy. It's very much one of those books that I don't know. It's just like you were saying, it's so calming. Her writing style is just so peaceful, even though there may be some like tragic things happening in the book. You still sit there with a sense of peace about the story and your own general feeling. A Miyazaki film. Kind of. Yes. It's beautiful. It's calm. And yeah, there's some tragic and there's some darkness here and there, but you never really get too deep into that darkness. Right. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So hands down, this was my favorite book this month for sure. Perfect to read in the fall. It is, as of the time of this podcast, not out yet, right? Yeah, it's either the 5th or the 12th. So it may either have come out yesterday or it may be out next week. I don't know (laughs) which one. (laughs) Um, Perfect, perfect fall read. So that is our favorite books for the month. Uh, Let us know if you liked this format at all. You know, we'll probably do a little bit more like that. Or if you're like, no, we need this shorter. Let us know. So thank you for listening to Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things we talked about in today's podcast. You can find Lainey on at Zany Lainey or me at One True Hazard. You can also find at Elated Geek on our Instagram, and you can also find Elated Geek Tweets on Twitter. If you want to go to a website, we have www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us to continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics that you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. And until next time, geek out.